Your Superior Self, Episode 40. So I was a really unhappy, miserable, micromanaged investment banker. And I worked in uh, with private equity groups with in mergers and acquisitions, mid-market, you know, five to 500 million in enterprise value. And I had a 45 minute commute to work and back. It was long hours, it was high stress. And Trey, it got so bad for me that I didn't get the Sunday blues anticipating Monday coming around. I'd get the Friday blues anticipating the weekend going by really fast. Welcome to Your Superior Self Podcast. I am Trey Downs, blue collar worker turned into blue collar entrepreneur. And each week I will interview inspiring influencers that will help you find your why. Thank you for hanging out with me today and let's get after it. Hey, what's up guys? Real quick, I wanna take a moment and talk about Alan Stein Jr.'s new book called Raise Your Game. Alan Stein Jr. is an amazing author and former Your Superior Self guest, by the way. Alan is a big supporter of what I'm trying to do with the podcast, and in his book, Raise Your Game, he shares secrets and principles of world-class performers that will help you elevate your game and achieve greater success. Raise Your Game will help you drill down on your answers to these vital questions like, what sacrifices do I need to make? What skills do I need to acquire? Whose help would I benefit from? What challenges should I expect? And what habits do I need to change? This book will be the initial spark to raising your game in every area of your life. Just to give you an idea of how impactful this book is, here are what people are saying. Kevin Durant, Golden State Warrior, NBA superstar and champion, says, quote, Allen played a huge role in my development on and off the court and in his guidance helped me to get to where I am today. This book is a must read, end quote. John Gordon, best-selling author of Training Camp and The Carpenter, said, quote, Allen shares what it takes to take your game to the next level. Raise Your Game provides tools, concepts, and strategies you can utilize today to enhance your influence and make an immediate impact on your team, culture, and organization, end quote. Do yourself a favor and pre-order Raise Your Game by Alan Stein Jr. on Amazon today. For more information about Alan Stein or the book, please visit RaiseYourGameBook.com. Nora Roberts said, know what you want, work hard to get it, then value it once you have it. This quote to me is probably the toughest quote to live your life by. Because I've done all three of these things, but not necessarily at the same time. I think the hardest one out of all of these is to know what you want. Because if you don't really know what you want, then that leads you down the path of working hard towards something that you don't really know where you're going. And then once you get there, you don't value it because it's not really what you wanted to begin with. Knowing what you want out of the gate is probably the most important step that you need to take. That would be step one, and that is crucial to your path to success. If you don't know what you want, you don't know how to work hard for it and then when you're lost a year or two years down the road you've lost that time so really get in to your head into your soul and find out what it is that makes you tick what is it that you want and have a clear vision on that and, and a clear process on how to get it and then when you really want something you really put in the hard work and once you get it you will value it you will value it and no one can take that away from you. And that will give you momentum to go on to the next thing. And I could talk about this all day long, but I want to talk about tonight's guest. His name is Mark Podolsky. And in 2001, Mark was only armed with about $3,000 gut-wrenching fear 
and absolutely no real estate experience when he bought his first few parcels of raw land in 2001. Today, Mark is the owner of Frontier Properties, a very reputable and successful land investing company, and he's been buying and selling land full-time since 2001 by focusing on working smart, not hard. He has completed over 5,000 land deals with an average ROI return on investment of over 300%, wow, on cash flips and over 1,000% on deals he sells with financing terms. Prior to his land investing success, Mark had a high stress, soulless corporate job and he felt trapped in a state of solo economic dependency, meaning income stopped as soon as he stopped working. He finally escaped that dependency and and he changed his life in so many positive ways that he decided to teach and coach and mentor others to help them achieve their financial goals. I'm excited about this interview. I hope you guys are too. So with that said, let's get after it. Mark Podolsky, what's going on, buddy? Welcome to the show. Trey Downs, thanks so much for having me. I really appreciate it. So my first question is, how do you go from corporate soulless job to real estate investing? So I was a really unhappy, miserable, micromanaged investment banker. And I worked in uh, with private equity groups with in mergers and acquisitions, mid-market, you know, five to 500 million in enterprise value. And I had a 45 minute commute to work and back. It was long hours. It was high stress. And Trey, it got so bad for me that I didn't get the Sunday blues anticipating Monday coming around, I'd get the Friday blues anticipating the weekend going by really fast and having to be back at work on Monday. So my firm hires this guy and he's telling me that on the side as a side hustle, he's going to tax deed auctions. He's buying up raw land, pennies on the dollar. He's flipping them online and he's making an average return of 300%. Hmm. So, I'm looking at companies all day long in a great company, a great company has 15% EBITDA margins or free cash flow. Great company. Your average company is at 10% and I'm looking at companies all day long, less than 10%. So of course I don't believe him. So we go to New Mexico together. I've got three grand saved up for car repairs and I do exactly what he says. I buy up 10 half acre parcels at an average price of $300 each. I put them up online. They all sell at an average price of $1,200 each. It worked. So <laughs> I, I took all that money. I went to another tax deed auction in Arizona where I lived. And again, this is 2000. There's no one in the room. I'm buying up lots. I'm buying up acreage for nothing. And over the next six months, I sold all that property and I made over $90,000 cash. So I go to my wife. I'm like, honey, I'm going to quit my job and I'm going to become a full-time land investor. She's pregnant at the time. She's like, absolutely not. So I said, fine. So I worked it as a side hustle and it took 18 months for the land investing income to exceed the investment banking income. And then I quit and I've been doing it full time ever since. Mm. So you have $3,000, like was that, and your wife was pregnant. Was that just sitting aside or was it? Yeah, uh, it was sitting aside for car repairs. And you, you just took a, like, I, obviously you trusted this guy to actually follow his advice and do this, right? No, I didn't trust him at all. And I said to my <laughs> wife, I said, look, let's just look at this like this. Worst case scenario, we own land, mm-hmm. right? It's an asset. Maybe I could barter for like free haircuts or uh, dental, you know, dental. Like if I can't sell it, you know, it's not like I'm going to fill up the garage with a bunch of junk. And she's like, okay. So... Mm-hmm. That's really how I convinced her. Like the worst case scenario isn't so bad. Hmm. So why don't you go ahead and tell us a little bit more about yourself and what you're up to today? So I've done over 5,500 land deals since 2001. I'm a full-time land investor. And essentially, um, I've got the land investing company. I also have a training company. So I'm on a mission to rid the world of what I call 
solo economic dependency, which means if you're not working, you're not making any money. And so even people like surgeons or uh, lawyers or CPAs, they're just high paid plumbers in my eyes, right? If they're not working, they're not making any money. And so in land investing, I teach people how to create a stream in that raw land so that they're working because they want to, not because they have to. Mm -hmm. um, then I, and within that, I also created a software startup called geekpay.io and uh, I have several other things, other, other companies as well. So I'm a busy serial entrepreneur, but you know, essentially, the land investing business is 90% automated. So I only work an hour a week in the business and it's just this big machine. And you know, the game that we like to play with our clients is, can we create enough of these land notes where it exceeds your fixed expenses and then you're working because you want to, not because you have to. Mm, I love that. But for most of us out here, I mean, I think land intimidates us a little bit because there's a lot of contracts, a lot of, um, extra things that go into place when purchasing anything that's, you know, deals with real estate. You have a, you know, I know I just purchased a house and it was a thousand page uh, document that I had to sign. What are some of the fears that aren't really reality when, in, when investing in real estate? Well, I think in my niche, it is very simple. Um, for example, like the contracts are all automated. It's in our software. So you just press a button and it generates it. So you don't have to do that. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so technology has really taken out all that fear. So a purchase sale agreement that's been vetted by a lawyer, a land sale contract, which has been vetted by a lawyer and a promissory note, which has been vetted by a lawyer is what you need to give your borrowers. It's all digitally signed by a DocuSign or EchoSign. So again, we provide all those tools for our clients to eliminate sort of this you know, the fear of the unknown, if mm -hmm. you will. So mm -hmm. if you want, let me kind of walk you through the process so sure. you can see how simple it is. So, so Trey, where do you live? Uh, Baltimore, Maryland. So you're in Baltimore, Maryland. And let's say for example, that you own 20 acres of raw land in Texas, right? Mm -hmm. And you owe $200 in back taxes. So I get the list from the treasurer, the tax delinquent list. I say, oh, Trey Downs, Baltimore, Maryland owes $200 in back taxes. Well, you're advertising two things to me. Number one, you have no emotional attachment to that raw land. Mm -hmm. You live in Maryland, the property's in Texas. And number two, you're distressed in some way because when we don't pay for something, we typically don't value it anymore. And you haven't paid your property taxes. So what I'll do is I'll look at the comparable sales for that 20 acre parcel, for let's say the last 12 to 18 months. And all I'm gonna do is divide by four. And that's gonna get me what Warren Buffett would call a 300% margin of safety. So in our example, let's say it's $10,000. The most I'm gonna pay for your property tray is $2,500. And so I'm gonna send you an offer of $2,500 in the mail. Now in reality, three to 5% of people accept our quote unquote top dollar offer. You've been getting notices from the treasurer every single month, if you don't pay your taxes, you're gonna lose that property to a tax lien or tax deed sale. So you're like 2,500 bucks, better than nothing, I'll take it. Mm. So then you accept the offer. Then what we do is we go through due diligence or our research and we wanna make sure you still own the property. We wanna make sure there's no liens or encumbrances, no breaks in the chain of title. We go through a whole checklist. We pay about $11 that's outsourced to our team in the Philippines that's been trained. So they pre provide the GIS maps, the GPS coordinates, the plat maps, the aerial maps, and everything that we're gonna need for our due diligence is what a buyer is gonna want to know on the other side. So at the same time that we're doing our due diligence, we're also creating our marketing package. So let's say that everything checks out, I pay you $2,500, you deed the property to me, then I have a built-in best buyer for that property. Do you know who it is? I have no clue, man. The neighbors. <laughs> the neighbors. So I sent out neighbor letters saying, hey, here's your opportunity to protect your privacy, protect your view. And oftentimes the neighbors will buy it for $10,000. Now the way that I'm going to sell it is where the magic happens. So I'm going to take a $2,500 down payment. 
I'm going to get my money out on the down payment or within, say, six months of the down payment. And then I'm just making a car payment. Let's say $449 a month for the next 84 months at 9% interest. And then using geekpay.io, I'm going to automate it with our set it and forget it system. And now I've got $449 a month coming in every single month for the next 84 months. I don't deal with any renters, rehabs, renovations, or rodents. Because I don't have to deal with a tenant, I'm exempt from any onerous real estate legislation like Dodd-Frank, RESPA, or the SAFE Act. Mm. So this is why we call it the best passive income model. I shuffle paper, I make passive income. I love that. Like how important is passive income? I don't think people realize that. Well, It's the best income. It's the only income because what happens if you have active income, like, you know, let's take the neurosurgeon, for example. He gets into an ATV accident, breaks his hand, he has no more income except for maybe disability insurance, which isn't going to cover his, his day to day. I mean, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Yeah, you sure. can get laid off at any time. If you don't have passive income right now, you're really at lots, you're taking lots, lots of risk. Mm. So tell me more about you, Mark. Um, you, took a took a leap of faith right so you took a leap of faith and in, in, in leaving your your day job for the side hustle i want to talk about that like what fears did you encounter i mean was it like all right this is a home run i should be doing this anyway or is it did you still have kind of some reservations about doing it you know it's so funny because i was really i really sort of proved the model to myself and then i didn't quit until I had more income from land investing than I did from the investment banking job. Mm -hmm. So I really eliminated a lot of anxiety for myself and my wife by doing it that way. And even still, I was still scared to death because now no more health insurance, right? No more benefits. There was no net. It was all, you know, if I don't sell my land, I'm not going to make any money. So there's that certain insecurity like, well, what if this thing goes bad? And it, it was scary, but the, on the other side of it was all the benefits of being a, a true entrepreneur. Like I work when I want, where I want, with whom I want. And that to me, that freedom was more valuable in the long run in reducing my stress than, you know, the fear of, of, secu of not having security. Mm -hmm. And ultimately that fear was not, you know, it was unfounded. So, you know, did you always have the support of your wife? Was she right there, right behind you the entire way with your side hustle? Or was it kind of like, eh, well, you know, just do it. We'll see where it goes from here. I mean, she, you know, she was tentative, especially in the beginning, like what's going to happen. You're, you're spending this three grand and you know, what if you don't sell the property? So we really sort of reverse engineered it and we kind of looked at the market. We looked at, you know, how big is the market? Um, because I, you know, from my analytical side, like I'm a geek, right? Mm -hmm. um, I'm not going to just jump into any industry after looking at all these industries and be like, well, this thing doesn't have any legs. So I really did a lot of analysis before I would put myself and my family at risk. And, you know, there's billions of acres of land available. Private equity groups aren't in the business. Hedge funds aren't in the business. They want to be in housing and doing bigger deals. So essentially, we have almost no competition. We have an inefficient market. And it's, it's really a, a phenomenal way to, to grow your net worth. Because you're not going to go on HGTV or the DIY network and watch a show called Flip This Land. It's just me in front of my computer. <laughs> it's like the before picture is land and the after picture is land. <laughs> That's pretty funny. I like that. So let's say I'm a blue collar guy and I got maybe a thousand dollars. How do I start? So for a thousand dollars, so Paul Mendel was this guy, right? He's my client. He's like, Mark, all I have money for is out, send out a mailing. He's like, I have no money to buy land. I said, no worries. So essentially he, he mails upstate New York. He gets a guy who's got five acres and he locks it up for, I want to say like five grand, right? So he tells the seller, look, um, I'm, it's going to take me 90 days to do due diligence and we're going to close in 90 days, right? And so the seller's like, fine, because there's no one else really chasing this deal. And what Paul does then is says, because it only takes seven days to do due diligence at the most. So what Paul does next is he sends out neighbor letters 
and he finds somebody who wants to buy the property for 15 grand. So he says to that buyer, look, you know, here it is. So the buyer then pays Paul 15,000. He then pays his seller five grand and he does a double closing. Mm -hmm. So he sends it to the recorder, record this deed first, record this deed second. He creates $10,000 and an infinite ROI just by sending out mailings. Mm -hmm. Is that the best way to, uh, you know, get the word out or um, let's say market your, you know, market the land? Is it the best way to mailings? What's the best way to get the, to get buyers or possible buyers for, for parcels of land? So, you know, we go through a, a marketing protocol. So the best buyers are going to be the neighbors. If the neighbors pass, we go to our buyers list. So our buyers list are people that have opted in with their email address for something of value. Like we make them a better land investor. So we know they're interested in raw land. If then our buyers list passes, we go to a little website you've probably never heard of called Craigslist. It's the 10th most trafficked website in the United States. And using software called postingdomination.com forward slash the land geek, we can automate our postings by just pressing a button. And we do the same thing with Facebook, right? So now we're marketing Craigslist, Facebook marketing marketplace, Facebook buy sell groups. Then we'll go to these sites called the land sites. It's landmoto.com, landsofamerica.com, landflip.com, landhub.com. These are land sites that pay money on the Google juice, drive traffic to their site that people know are looking for raw land. So you can list there. But if you can't sell that property in 30 days or less, something's gone terribly wrong with your pricing. Like you want to make it irresistible. Hmm. So going back to your, your, your soulless corporate job, right? I want to know why, why weren't you content with that? Like what was there, like were you, did you have this awakening as an entrepreneur moment or, or what, what did that look like for you? I mean, for me, you know, not being able to, you know, spend enough time with my wife, right? Like I just had two days with her. And those two days I wasn't present because I was so worried about Monday coming around. Um, there was so much stress and pressure. There were so many things in my job I couldn't control, right? And I'm kind of a control freak. And so for me, working in a corporate environment just as a bad fit. Like I, I just knew like this isn't me. I don't like having to be somewhere at a certain time. I don't like when I'm sick having to call somebody and ask permission to be sick and say, mm -hmm. oh, okay but that's your fifth sick day. You don't get to be sick again. I mean, I don't like fighting traffic with everyone else. Mm. And so for me, it was just, it was a means to an end to get to the next place in my life. I always, my dad was an entrepreneur. My grandfather was an entrepreneur. My uncles are entrepreneurs. So I kind of grew up kind of knowing like, I want to be an entrepreneur. I mean, when I was a kid, I was like the corsage guy in high school. I had a corsage business. I was like the corsage mafia. You're going to prom or homecoming. You had to go through me to get your corsage. I had a cookie company. I'd go around door to door when I was a little kid. I'd sell these cookies and I had no overhead because I was using my mom's materials. I had a lemonade stand. I always liked the little hustle. So for me, it was always like, what am I going to do that that's going to just you know, be my entrepreneurial journey. And then since then, you know, I wrote a book called Dirt Rich. I've got a software startup. Um, I've got a fund. I've got, you know, the training company. I've got my land investing company. Um, and so it's just, for me, it just keeps, I just keep going to create more and more, uh, you know, enterprises that don't take my time. Hey guys, I hope you're enjoying the episode. I wanted to take a minute and thank today's sponsor. After that, I promise we'll get back after it. But here at Your Spirit Yourself Podcast, I hand select the sponsors that come on the show because I think that they have incredible value that they can offer to you through this show. So today's sponsor is Raise Your Game by Alan Stein Jr. Anyone that pre-orders a book and wants to give it as a gift for the holidays... Alan will hand write a letter that they can actually give as the gift and let them know it will be well worth the wait since a book won't arrive until January. Raise Your Game by Alan Stein will be available January 8th, 
on Amazon. Pre-order now for your holiday gifts. Now back to the show. Okay. So I want to, I want to hammer that home. You know, you have all these other different um, income, um, you know, cash flows and, and, and different, um, you know, income streams coming in. Did someone help you with this? Did you have a mentor? How did, I mean, how did Mark go from starting a side hustle to now basically having his own little empire? Right, right. So unfortunately in 2001 to about 2010, I was drunk on my own success and I didn't have a mentor. I was just, if you, you know, know anything about real estate at the time, anybody was could have made money in real estate. Like, you know, a monkey could have made money in real estate. And I was that dumb monkey. <laughs> and so it wasn't until 2010, I got really hit. I lost about 50% of my income. And I, then I had Parkinson's law of money. So the more money I made, like my, my nice house wasn't nice enough. I had to get a huge house, right? And then within my huge house, I had three kids. I had to get a nanny. Well, then the house was dirty. Then I get a housekeeper five days a week. So I had a nanny five days a week, housekeeper five days a week. My wife didn't work. So then I had to have private school for the kids. I had to have a bigger car because my neighbors had bigger cars than me. I kept, you know, upping my overhead over my overhead and, and just horrible. So 2010 comes around, I get this dose of humility and I'm like, okay, what's really important to me in life? And the stuff really didn't make me happy. It actually kind of stressed me out. And then my wife and I and the kids were forced to like, instead of going to Mastro's for a steak on Wednesday night, we're playing charades together. And so I go through all this and that's when I decided like, Hey, I'm not the smartest guy in the room and left to my own devices. I'm going to make a lot of mistakes. I want to find somebody who's already sort of climbed that mountain. And that's when I got my mentor, Ori and Ori sold his company for 360 million. And he had a mentor, Mort Meyerson, who's a billionaire. So mm. these are really smart mentors. And then from now on, I've always had mentors everywhere I go. And I've made literally million dollar mistakes in land investing. And so now I want a mentor so people don't have to go through the pain I went through. So you talk about that dose of reality. What was that dose of reality for you? I think the reality was that for me, like this, this feeling of not being enough. And so no matter what I did, you know, the bigger house, still not enough. The bigger car, not enough. You know, my ego just kept getting fed and fed. And it was never enough. And so this sort of this void in me that was like, I'm not enough. Mm -hmm. um, I finally came to this reality that, you know, no one cares. Like this is, this is an internal journey. Like the world could care less about me. So was and, it, I mean, like, I, you know, I think a I lot need, of people I need to be happy with me. Sorry about that. Um, what, I mean, like, was it, was it like a conversation with your wife? I mean, I think a lot of people will like, go on cruise control with this and still do it like 20 years, you know, from now, some people will still be doing the same thing, right? They'll still be, you know, in competition with this, the Joneses and they'll still be, um, you know, going to private school, nanny, you know, the, it's all relative, right? It's, it's right. If you make $250,000 a year, you're going to live like you make $250,000 a year. So with that awakening for you, was it like a moment where you just kind of like sat back and was like, man, when is enough going to be enough? Or was it like, I mean, nothing really happened to you to kind of shake you out of that. Yeah. I mean, I think, um, you know, I went into therapy was that helped a lot. So having this other person sort of like mirroring back to me, um, in, in a nice way. Right. So I wasn't kind of like hitting the head with it. Um, that really helped. I think, I think it was just a process of, of going through it myself, my wife and whittling down our overhead slowly and realizing like, Hey, this isn't so bad. Well, how did you do that? How'd you get, how'd you limit some of that overhead? You just start. So we got, rid of the, we got rid of the nanny. We got rid of the housekeeper. I sold my car. Um, we got a smaller house and um, that's, that was really it. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the company was still profitable. I just had to get off the, to the treadmill of my overhead. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, thank you for sharing the fact that you went and saw a counselor. I think that a lot of guys look at it as I'm, a, I'm macho. I don't go, I don't do that. How does it help you become a, a better person or free you spiritually? Well, I, I think that 
you know, the benefits for me are number one, you know, sort of whittling down my ego, right? Like my ego is big. And then, you know, the ego is just like this defense for me. And so kind of having somebody lovingly show it to me, and this is how it's, you know, sort of impacting all your relationships. And then from there, you start to sort of realize like at the end of the day, right? Um, you know, ego is sort of this, it's just this sort of this false thing that you, you create in your imagination. It's not, it's not really real in the sense that, you know, let, let's just face it, like three generations from now, no one's going to remember me, right? So I, I started kind of realizing like just how insignificant I really am and to not get worked up about, let's say, hey, you know, is Joe impressed with me? Well, Joe's not even thinking about me. So what do I need to, you know, like my house is great, but the people who really enjoyed it were people that visited me, right? Like, oh man, you got such a great house. You have such a great life. Like, well, I'm the one who's paying for all this stuff, mm -hmm. right? I'm the one paying for landscaper. <laughs> so like this thing is so great for me. And, uh, and kind of just slowly kind of seeing it, um, mm -hmm. I think really, really helped. And, and now I have a very simple goal. It just, I just want to be a good ancestor. Mm. That's it. You know? That's powerful. I've never heard that before. I want to be a good ancestor. Yeah, I want to, you know, just be a good ancestor for my kids and, you know, live the sort of value, purpose-driven life that contribute, do something bigger than yourself. And, you know, happiness, will you kind of stumble upon it, right? Mm. Yeah, well, I can relate. I have two children of my own. Um, and, and having that entrepreneurial mindset, how do you like balance the two, like between really being a successful entrepreneur and being a really good father? Yeah, I mean, you know, the, it goes family first, right? So there are no land emergencies. In fact, there's no business emergencies. No one's going to die if I don't answer their email. I check email twice a day. Um, I rarely am on my phone. Like I meditate every day. So, you know, I'm really trying to be more present, more in the moment. And when I'm like that with my children, you know, they get filled up, I get filled up and then it's okay for me to work. Like for me in the beginning, like work was this distraction so that I, I could avoid, you know, a lot of sort of painful stuff that I didn't want to face, right? Like the feeling of not being enough. So if I could just work, work it all the time, like I'd have my kids at the park and I'd be on my phone working. Like I wasn't with them. I looked good. Oh, look, you know, Mark's playing at the park. I wasn't really playing at the park. I was, I was on the phone. And, um, and so today I'm really, really aware of what really makes me happy in life. And that's the quality of my relationships. So how do I create joy and how do I deepen those relationships? Um, you know, and it's usually just very simple things. It's, you know, really actively listening to my children, my wife, spending time with her. You know, I work three days a week. Um, Mondays and Fridays are what I call my terminal days. So I pretend like this is my last day on earth. How do I want to spend it? And usually it's like, let's go have lunch with my wife, take the kids to school, pick them up, you know, take a hike or a bike ride and, and do these things that just deepen relationships. That is awesome. I love that. I want to start doing that Mondays and Fridays, just doing what I want. But of course, I'm living the corporate life right now and I only have eight sick days. Right. <laughs> um, yeah, so, you, you got you to start land investing as a side hustle. <laughs> I know. We'll have a conversation after this. Um, how do you, how has gratitude improved your happiness? Well, I mean, I do a gratitude journal every morning. And, um, you know, it's so funny, like, when you really look at it, there's, there's like an unbelievable amount of things to be grateful for. And when I really look at all the things I sh I'm, I'm grateful for, um, like when I do my gratitude journal, like obviously, you know, when I first started, I'd be like, oh, I'm grateful for my health. I'm grateful for my family's health. Um, I'm grateful, you know, that I'm free, right? Or whatever it is. And then you start kind of going a little bit deeper with it. You know, I'm grateful for, you know, a, a clean glass of water, or I'm grateful that, um, you know, 
uh, a cool breeze in Scottsdale, Arizona, right? Mm-hmm. Like that's really nice. Um, I'm I'm grateful. Like I just did, uh, I had just was just in Orlando for uh, one of our boot camps. I was grateful that the bags got there, like arrived, right? Like it's not a given. Like this is amazing. <laughs> I put my bag somewhere. It, it just arrives on this conveyor. I'm so grateful. And so when you start seeing the world and like in all these things you can be grateful for, you feel great. Hmm. I love that gratitude. But I, what like what people might ask like what is gratitude other than saying thank you for being you know alive thank you for waking up thank you for the sun thank you for my bag showing up like what is the true meaning of gratitude like what is it what does it look like for you like the true meaning of gratitude i think the true meaning of gratitude is is being really happy for the things you currently have in your life Hmm. right so oftentimes we're always thinking about what we don't have well what happens when we reverse it and we're really grateful for what we do have. And so like people say, you know, live as if it's your last day on earth. Well, what if you reverse it? What if you live as if it's, you know, the people that you're communicating with, what is it their last day on earth? Right? So Trey, I'm talking to you. How would I treat you if I knew this is your last day on earth? Right? Mm-hmm. I, I wouldn't be real impatient if you had a tech issue before our podcast, right? Like, I'm not going to be a jerk about it. This is your last day on earth. Mm-hmm. No, that's, it makes sense. I mean, I, I do appreciate it. Uh, you guys might not know, but we had a te- I had technical difficulties with my audio and he treated me like I had, it was my last day on earth. So thank you, Mark, for that. Um, yeah. I appreciate it. We, we were able to switch over to Zoom and uh, it's working out beautifully. And I appreciate that. Um, so you talk a lot about last day on earth. It, there's a rumor that you have an obsession with death. Yeah, I do have an obsession with death. I have a death clock. So uh, I've got a Chrome tab. I've got right now 10,806 days left uh, according to the average you know, male lifespan. And so when you sort of have this awareness that you can die at any time, it, it, it gives you this feeling of urgency. Like I'm not going to waste my day, right? Um, you know, if I'm not happy with my job, let's say, well, life is short. Why would I ever spend another precious day on this earth doing something I don't want to do. And so, you know, it it really helps me focus on the most important things in life and really helps me say no to a lot of things I don't want to do. Mm -hmm. Wow. What's the most that you say no to? Like, what are the most, like most requests that you have to say no to? I mean, you know, there's, there's constant requests of, Hey, let's get together for this or let's get together for that. Or my wife say, hey, let's go out with this couple. I'm like, well, I don't like the guy. No, (laughs) no, no, no. (laughs) You know, let's go see uh, the new Bradley Cooper movie. I'm like, no, he's (laughs) I'm like, I'm I'm sure the reviews are great, but no. Like, let's go see the next Avengers movie. But, you know, I'll compromise. Sure. But, but, you know, um, I love this Derek Sivers line. He's like, if it's not hell, yes, it's no. Oh, I love that. Yeah. I like Derek. He's, 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 he's a great motivator. Yeah. So I want to respect your time and I appreciate you coming on. So I want to ask you a couple more questions and these are more like right, a reflect of who you are and where you are today. Like if you could go back and talk to the 21 year old self, Mark, and when he was 21, what would you say to him? Uh, number one, you know, don't take yourself so seriously. Number two, you know, nothing. <laughs> you know, you're, you literally know nothing. So whatever you think, you know, you're wrong. So try to be a little less wrong every single day. Um, just a, a dose of humility. And number three, get yourself a great mentor. Get yourself a lot of great mentors. For crying out loud, Mark, read more. Mm-hmm. I love that because I don't think a lot of people, you know, take, the, take advantage of it. We have so many great books out um, that we can, we have access to now with audible and, uh, just iPhones in general. Um, I think people need to take more, take more time to read and really just get someone else's perspective on, on things and insight and see it from their eyes, you know, uh, pick Mark's oh, yeah. book up and see what, you know, what he's talking about, what, what his beliefs are, what, what his investments are and get to know him from a, you know, a personal level. 
and uh, it, it changes, it changes things. It changes your perspective. I, I'm so in, like, I, I, I agree with you hundred percent. I wish when I was 21 that I had read more. I, I was like, ah, oh, reading puts me to sleep. But in the last three to four years, I have been on like this reading binge and I can't stop. Like my favorite, favorite book right now is um, The Alchemist. And, oh, Paulo Coelho is great. Uh, I love that book. It is so, so true. Everything in it with all the symbols and his path and I, just, I read it at least once every six months just to keep the, the, the memory fresh in, in the back of my mind. Um, so going with that, like, has there been signs in your life that have just spoken to you and, and pointed you in the right direction? Yeah, I mean, I remember uh, I, what really helped me get the courage to quit my job was reading Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Um, that was one of those transformative books for me. Uh, another one was Power of Now, Eckhart Tolle. Um, kind of woo woo, but was, you know, it's kind of, it was transformative. Mm -hmm. Um, the one thing by Gary Keller and the 12 week year have been unbelievable books for me. Uh, I kind of give away to my clients now. They're, they're so powerful. Deep work by Cal Newport Mm -hmm. is, is one of those great books. Um, so it's, it's like endless. It's the best time ever to be alive. And the way I can read so much, like my friends are like, how do you read so much? I'm like, well, I buy the audible, the audible and then I get the Kindle. And so I read and I listen at the same time and I immerse myself in the book and I get through it on really fast because I can listen to it on 2X and then just read fast. Hmm. You have a podcast too, don't you, Mark? Yeah, I've got the Art of Passive Income podcast. Um, that's the current one. I have the Best Passive Income Model podcast. And then my first podcast was the Land Geek podcast. And how many episodes are you up to now? Ah, oh my gosh. I mean, probably over 400 between all three. Wow. How many times, how many times a, is it once a week or what? Uh, Art of Passive Income podcast is twice a week. We have our round table where we talk about land investing. And then we have one like this where we take an expert and we just kind of get, you know, figure out their success secrets. That's awesome. Uh, so I hope you guys listen to that and get on that podcast. If you're interested in, in investing in land, check them out, check Marco out over there. Uh, Mark, last question. So speak to me right now, like you're speaking to an entrepreneur who needs help. Be my mentor, light me up, light the fire inside of my soul. I, I don't know what to do. I hate my corporate job. It's soulless. It sucks the life out of me. I have a long commute. I'm missing time with my children. What would you say to me to get me to take that leap of faith? I, I you know I love the Zig Ziglar quote. If you'll do for the next three to five years, what other people won't do, you'll be able to do for the rest of your life, what other people can't do. Mm. And so if you're able to have the courage to, you know, make this plan and say, Hey, look, you know, maybe if you got kids, like I'm not saying quit your job tomorrow, but make a plan start today on getting that side hustle, start getting some side income, start saving so that you can then go and take a little bit of risk and create the life of your dreams. I mean, it's, I would argue that it's riskier to keep a soulless corporate job today than it is to do your own thing. Because if you're doing your own thing, you're building your human capital. Even if you fail, you're getting so much out of that to go on to the next thing. Where if you're sort of in this corporate soulless job, you don't have time to even explore, to even grow as a, as a person or an entrepreneur, if that ultimately if that's what you want to do. Now, if you love your job, that's amazing. And I'd still argue that you're at risk and you should create some type of passive income side hustle to start building your net worth. Mm. How, can, how can my audience connect with you, Mark? I think the best place to go is the landgeek.com thelandgeek.com they can download for free our passive income blueprint get the ebook how to avoid the three fatal land buying mistakes and start getting our podcast delivered each week to their email inbox and then i'll tell you what trey if they want we have a a, a course called the passive income launch kit course it's normally 97 bucks but for your listeners if they just go to thelandgeek.com forward slash launch kit thelandgeek.com forward slash launch kit, they can get it for free. Wow, that's a huge value. Guys, check that out. Mark, thank you so much for joining Your Superior Self. I can't wait to talk to you in the future. 
and uh, you know, see you light the world on fire. Thanks, Trey. I want to say thank you to Mark for coming on Your Superior Self and hanging out with us today and speaking on real estate investing. And I want to say thank you to you right now, the listener. Thank you for downloading this episode. And please head over to iTunes or wherever you download your episodes from. Leave a rating and a review. It really helps me out. It helps me get my brand out there. It helps me get these episodes out there that can help people find their why. Be a part of my mission. Help me. You can follow us on all the social media. I'm on Facebook at Trey Downs. Big shocker. Instagram, T Downs 80 and Twitter at Downs Trey. Hit me up. Send me some comments. Let me know what you guys think. I love to hear from you. If you guys have some incredible guests in the back of your mind that I need to get on here, let me know. I'm wide open to uh, suggestions about people that are inspiring and motivating others to be a better version of themselves so send me a link send me something let me know i love connecting with you guys i love connecting with my listeners i love connecting with authors everybody who is on a mission of lighting this world on fire with inspiration so thank you guys so much for listening and i'll talk to you guys later